Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. The topic at this time is the Sengoku Jidai, which means the warring states period of Japan through late 15th century to early 17th century. The Sengoku Jidai is the period that samurai and ninjas were the most active and having lots of battles in Japanese history. So this period may be the most interesting one for the people who like samurai and ninja stuff. In this video, I would share the introduction and overview of Sengoku Jidai widely and shallowly, especially about the only war and the three great unifiers. So I try to make this video good for beginners of Japanese history. I hope you will enjoy and I'm happy if this video can be a chance you get interested more in Japanese history because I will make more detailed videos about the warring states period later in this channel. In Sengoku period, the warring states period of Japan, many feudal warlords were taking over the battles, but in the first place, why and how did this period of wars start? The period right before the warring states period is called Muromachi period. That Ashikaga clan was on the position of shogun in Muromachi shogunate, which was located in Kyoto. In a broad sense, the definition of Muromachi period is that it started when the first shogun Ashikaga Takauji established the Muromachi shogunate in 1338, which is the time around the Kajimishu III Welki took over the king in Poland and the Hundred Years War between England and France started. And the Warring States period of Japan ended when Oda Nobunaga, the one of the feudal warlords, expelled the 15th Shogun Ashikaga Yoshiaki from Kyoto in 1573, which is around the time European powers including Spain and Portugal were promoting colonial rule all over the world. But the decline and the collapse of Ashikaga Shogunate already started with the Oni War in 1467. And many daimyos, the feudal warlords, were taking over the battles and started fighting each other after the Oni War. So the Muromachi period and the Warring States period partially overlaps according to the definitions of Muromachi period. Number one, the beginning of the Warring States period of Japan, the Oni War. By the way, what is the Oni War? According to Wikipedia, the Oni War was a civil war that lasted from 1467 to 1477 during the Muromachi period in Japan. Oni refers to the Japanese era during which the war was fought. A dispute between Hosokawa Katsumoto and Yamana Sozen escalated into a nationwide war involving the Ashikaga shogunate and a number of daimyo in many regions of Japan. Alright, I would explain a little more detail about Oni War. Around the time the Byzantine Empire was collapsed and the Hundred Years War in Europe had ended, in Japan the Oni War occurred. The eighth shogun of Muromachi shogunate, Ashikaga Yoshimasa, was rather than being a politician or a man of the power, but who loved art and culture, etc. Then he was not interested in politics much and even did not actually want it to be a shogun too. Also, Yoshimasa and his wife Hino Tomiko did not have their son. So Yoshimasa decided and promised to inherit the position of ninth shogun to his brother, Ashikaga Yoshimi. Ashikaga Yoshimasa also appointed Hosokawa Katsumoto who was one of the powerful vassals as a guardian of the shogun position inheritance. But ironically, after their promise for the inheritance, Yoshimasa and Tomiko got their son Yoshihisa. Then Tomiko strongly wanted to make her son become the ninth shogun and try to make her husband Yoshimasa withdraw the succession to his brother Yoshimi. Hino Tomiko also asked another powerful vassal, Yamana Sozen, the support to make her kid become the ninth shogun. At this point, a dispute between Hosokawa Katsumoto and Yamana Sozen occurred. 
this dispute involved Muromachi shogunate and other powerful provincial military governors called guardian daimyo from all over Japan. Then it has developed into a big battle as if to divide Japan into two parts. And this war lasted for 11 years. Finally, Yoshihisa became the ninth shogun. The total number of soldiers mobilized in the Oni War could be more than 270,000. And it was the largest war inside of Japan in history. This is the simplified overview of the Oni War. Actually, the situation and relationships among the people related to this war is so much complicated than I am explaining in this video. So please check more detail on Wikipedia or other resources if you are interested in the Oni War. I would add a link to Wikipedia in the description of this video. By the way, I would like to discuss one more thing about the life of the 8th Shogun of Muromachi Shogunate, Yoshimasa. He might not have been a talented politician, but after retiring the shogun position, he erected Ginkakuji Temple, which is with a beautiful garden, now one of the world's cultural heritage sites. And also he erected Togudo that has a room called Dojinsai, with four and a half tatami mats for tea ceremony. And the format of having a tea ceremony in a room with four and a half tatami mats would be actually the basic idea of tea ceremony culture today. So he's one of the founders of traditional Japanese culture called Higashiyama culture that has been handed down today. After the Oni War, the ruling power of the Muromachi Shogunate was largely lost and the only the authority of the Shogun position was left. The reason why the position of Shogun, the formal name Seiyi Tai Shogun, still had the authority is because only the Emperor of Kyoto could officially appoint someone to be a Shogun and the Shogun means the Supreme General of all Samurais in Japan under the Emperor. Then you may wonder how much power the Emperors in Muromachi period had. Actually, during the Muromachi period and later, it could be said that the emperor had not ruled Japan substantially, and samurais ruled Japan. But one of the unique points of Japanese history is that everyone respected the emperor's authority, even when the emperor's substantive power weakened. As the power of the Muromachi shogunate weakened, lots of battles occurred among mainly warlords all over Japan. And it should be noted that sometimes merchants, peasants, and even Buddhists participated in the wars. Then the era that anyone on the low ranks can rise to the high ranks has begun. The appearance of this era when chances of success came to many people is called Gekokujo in Japanese. And those who intended to unify Japan and to establish the shogunate and gain the states of shogun began to emerge. This is the full-fledged beginning of Japan's warring state period. 2. The Rises of Great Unifiers Among the many warlords, the most famous ones are Takeda Shingen, Uesugi Kenshin, Mori Motonari, Saito Dosan, Hojo Ujiyasu, Shosokabe Motochika, Oda Nobunaga, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, Tokugawa Ieyasu, Date Masamune, Shimazu Yoshihisa, etc. At this time, I would focus on the three unifiers from the most famous ones. The first one is Oda Nobunaga. In the early stages of the Warring States period, many small powers were fighting each other and Many of them only cared about expanding their local territories and did not have idea of unification of Japan. So the chaotic state continued all over Japan. However, with the rise of Oda Nobunaga, the chaotic state was broken. Perhaps it would be more appropriate to say that he was a revolutionist rather than a warlord because he ignored some old traditions on politics, wars, and even cultures and tried doing something no one had ever done. There are many geniuses in this period of wars of Japan. Some historians recognize him as the greatest genius 
in the ruling state period, and he is the first person to open the way to unification in Japan. Here is an example that is revolutionary of Oda Nobunaga. When Nobunaga had a war against Takeda Katsuyori, the son of Takeda Shingen, Nobunaga used more than 3,000 matchlocks. The cavalry of Takeda clan was estimated as the strongest one in Japan, but Oda clan defeated Takeda using matchlocks at this war of Nagashino. Matchlocks takes 30 seconds to fire. So no warlords didn't use matchlocks on wars because while soldiers are preparing to fire the matchlocks, the enemies reaches to them. So Oda Nobunaga's army made three lines formation of matchlock soldiers on the edge of the battlefield and while the front line soldiers are firing their matchlocks, the behind soldiers on the second line prepare to fire and so on. So they could fire like about every 10 seconds. As a result, Takeda clan lost a lot of talented vassals and soldiers and they got finally destroyed soon after this war. But actually there is not enough historical evidence of the fact that Oda clan made the three line formation at this war too. But at least this battle was a first battle that more than 3000 matchlocks were used even in the world history for sure. Well. I will focus on what were great of Oda Nobunaga in other videos later. Actually, he is one of my favorite warlords of Japan. The second unifier is Toyotomi Hideyoshi. He was actually one of the vassals of Oda Nobunaga and was originally from a peasant family. Oda Nobunaga employed him as a vassal and Hideyoshi made lots of remarkable military achievements and after Nobunaga died, he finally completed the unification of Japan almost completely. Hideyoshi had particularly a great talent for politics. It may be because he originally had a human attraction, but there is no doubt that he had the talent to draw the people around him to his side. As Oda Nobunaga's thoughts were too advanced and difficult to understand for others, so many people around Nobunaga were afraid of and against him. For example, Takenaka Hanbei, who had a reputation as a war genius, already retired as young because he did not want to be a vassal under anyone. However, Oda Nobunaga wanted to use his talent and to employ Hanbei as a vassal of Oda clan. Then Hideyoshi visited Hanbei to convince him to be Nobunaga's vassal, but Hanbei did not want to work under Nobunaga, and he refused to be a vassal. After repeating this three times, Hanbei responded that he would like to work as a direct report of Hideyoshi. As a result, Hanbei won lots of fame on the battlefield under Hideyoshi, and he supported Hideyoshi a lot. I imagine that if Hideyoshi did not meet Hanbei, Hideyoshi could not achieve a successful career. But I do not think Hideyoshi was just a lucky guy to have Hanbei as his direct report because it was Hideyoshi's talent to convince Hanbei to be his direct report. The third person is Tokugawa Ieyasu. He eventually achieved the perfect unification of Japan and established the Edo Shogunate, also called Tokugawa Shogunate in Edo, now Tokyo. As you may already know, he was the first shogun of the Edo shogunate that brought peace for the next 260 years of Japan until 1867. My personal image about him is a person of patience. He had spent time as a hostage of the Imagawa clan since he was a small kid. After Nobunaga defeated Imagawa Yoshimoto, Ieyasu got be independent, and he formed an alliance with Nobunaga. I called it alliance, but the master detail relationship was clear, and he was clearly treated as Nobunaga's servant. He had strived steadily and gaining experience under Nobunaga and Hideyoshi for few decades, and after their death, 
he finally won in the Battle of Sekigahara as the Marshal of the Eastern Army, and he destroyed the Toyotomi clan in the sieges of Osaka in the last part of the Warring States period. Then he finally established the Edo Shogunate. Here is a famous quote from Ieyasu. Patience is the most important for keep everything safe and longer. Anger is the enemy. Thinking of victory always and never experiencing to lose is not only a good thing, but also that false ideal will harm your future. Alright, that's it for this time. I think it is very valuable to know the dramas of those great people in history. For me, knowing the lives of great people is the best part of studying history. But unfortunately, in history education in Japan, it is the main thing to memorize the years and events just mechanically. By the way, how is your country's history education? I wonder if it can be the lessons of life from such mechanical memory work or not. That is why I would like to share those valuable things for me in history on this channel. My channel is still new and has a small number of videos. So for now, I will make videos that are an introduction to history. After that, I will make more detailed videos of history. So please look forward to watching the other videos. Alright, thank you very much for watching and please subscribe my channel for more of my contents if you would like it. See you in next video. Bye.